Iranians head to the polls in June to elect a new leader. And in the lead up, a familiar face has come to the foreground. Mahmoud Ahmadinejad. His two presidential terms were marred by sanctions imposed in response to his country's nuclear program. We sit down with Iran's former hardliner president and ask if Iran is being singled out by the United States. President Joe Biden is now opening the negotiating door to one of his thorniest foreign policy issues. The path for diplomacy remains there. Um, we hope to be able to pursue it. And is he hopeful that a new page can be turned with another adversary? How about Israel? A decade ago, Ahmadinejad shocked the world by saying the Holocaust was a myth. What are his thoughts on relations today? Are they as fiery as ever? President Ahmadinejad, thank you for joining us on this program. Iran is scheduled to hold presidential elections this June. And according to a recent poll, you are the leading, you are the preferred candidate amongst the voters. While this, of course, begs the question now, if you are ready, if you are gearing up for a political comeback, are you? I have not been far from the political scene of Iran. How can a person possibly remain careless about the fate of his country? Some people think a person should care about his country only if he has a political responsibility, but it's not right. Social responsibility is a general idea and all of us should care about our societies and their fate. We must engage with the political issues of our country because we are human and we care for humanity and social problems. You served as president for two consecutive terms from 2005 to 2013. But the Guardian Council disqualified you from running again in 2017, which would have been, in essence, your third term. If you were to throw your head in the ring again, are you concerned that such a scenario could be repeated? I haven't yet set my position on the upcoming elections. I also have a few suggestions and propositions. I will share these with my people when the time comes. It's still too early to decide and speak about that. One thing is for certain, whoever is going to become president of Iran this June is going to inherit many domestic and international challenges, not the least, of course, U.S.-Iranian relations. It is my understanding that you have sent a letter to the new U.S. President Joe Biden. What was in the letter? In the past 15 years, I have written a number of letters to U.S. presidents stating the conditions of the board and the problems American politicians have caused in world politics. I guess you are well aware of current U.S. politics and the problems caused by politicians. In the latest letter, I made some suggestions to solve these problems. All these letters are written in good faith, not just for the American people, but also for other nations. I also touched on the relations between the two countries. You know, in the last 40 years, decisions by politicians have damaged relations between the two. 
In all my letters, I have spoken about just how important relations between the U.S. and Iran are and that politicians should do their best to ensure that ties are not cut. I have mentioned how certain policies have damaged relations between the two countries and suggested that the two sides should come together and solve these issues with an eye for justice. The number one sticking issue, of course, between U.S. and Iran remains the nuclear issue. President Biden seems willing to revive the 2015 nuclear agreement, but he insists that Iran must first reverse its nuclear steps. Iran, on the other hand, demands that the U.S. must first lift sanctions before one can even discuss reviving the deal. It seems that a dead end has been hit. Who's going to blink first? Who's going to make the first move? I don't believe the first issue between the U.S. and Iran is what you just mentioned. It is rather setting up relations between the two nations that can help solidarity and worldwide peace. Both American and Iranian nations have a huge capacity, but neither is using it. A change in relations between the two countries occurred after the JCPOA, and the first question I should ask is, does anybody know what has been written in the JCPOA? And as for the matter of who should take the first step in negotiations, you will see that right from the beginning, six countries thought differently from Iran on the nuclear issue. But they sat down, negotiated, and now they have an agreement. I don't have anything to say about this agreement, which holds benefit for both sides. I don't have anything to say about it. I'm trying to highlight something else. We have an agreement which also leads to problem-solving issues, where six countries are on this side and one country on the other. It's stated that if there's any problem, all seven countries should sit down and resolve it. But from the perspective of international law, this is awful. How could six parties have one vote and just one party has another? It is quite clear this will solve no problems. And I think this is the weak point of the agreement. We also see that one of these countries has not fulfilled its commitment and has caused big problems for the sides, while others are not treating the issue as seriously as the U.S. I think we will revise all problems from the start based on justice and respect between two sides. And any revision should lead to a just and respectful agreement that takes into regard the rights of each nation, which will bring an end to 40 years of enmity. It was under your watch that Iran began enriching uranium, a decision that many analysts say isolated Iran on the international scene. In hindsight, do you have any regrets about this decision? First of all, Iran is not a country without any relations with others. In my time, more than 150 presidents visited Iran. And I, too, visited more than 150 countries. Major conferences, especially near the end of my term, were held in Tehran with maximum attendance by foreign presidents. Iran's international trade grew more than seven times. So I don't think your assessment is accurate. You see, the international powers, the superpowers, are taking this primarily as a nuclear issue. But it really isn't. So many countries around the world have uranium enrichment programs, and they're not taken as seriously as Iran. The superpowers are thinking wrong about Iran. They think the Iranian nation is their rival to manage the world. That's why they worry about Iran 
and take it seriously. But I think they are wrong on that. If the West had cooperated and helped the people of Iran, who made the revolution 42 years ago, to gain freedom, justice, independence and sovereignty over their own destiny, it would have now won. I firmly say that the competition in some Western countries with the Iranian people will not succeed. They should get to know the Iranian people and cooperate with the Iranian people. It will be good for both sides. I say this empathetically to Western countries. They are racing with the Iranian nation to manage the world. It is not for their benefit, you see. It is not for the benefit of the EU nor for the UN. If they cooperate with Iran, it will be good for the entire nations of the world and for world peace. During these years, they have placed many kinds of pressure on the people of Iran. Persisting with these is neither good for them nor the benefit of other nations. A big nation cannot be isolated. They may place certain pressures because the world's monetary system and most of its political system are in their hands. But if you think about the future, for example, the nuclear issue, where we are playing by the rules, international powers should stop pressuring Iran and instead try to cooperate, where we can use this capacity to try and build the world together. If some nations want to go about this by ruling over other countries, well, let me say that Iran is not a country that's been mapped by superpowers. Iran is one of the most ancient countries in the world with a history going back thousands of years. We would like to live with justice and build the world with other nations for a future that offers welfare and peace for all countries and where people love each other. All people should have a say in this future. The nuclear issue, I think, is a good opportunity to transform things into a friendship. And I think there is nothing to be gained with superpowers continuing to behave as they are. I think the agreement should be done according to international law. The current deal has no regard for international law and is therefore not successful. I suggest that both sides leave enmity aside and begin friendly negotiations for once to try and solve the problems. Today's conditions will change. I'm sure they will. And it's better to play a positive role in this change for the benefit of nations, peace, justice, and humanity. You have already indicated that you are hoping for a new, more fruitful, more productive chapter in U.S.-Iran relations. And one of the first international decisions taken by President Biden certainly works in Tehran's favor. He has removed Yemen's Hutu rebels, which are backed by Iran, from the U.S. terrorism list and has announced an end to American support for the Saudi-led offensive in Yemen. Is this a good window of opportunity to end the long and bloody war in Yemen? Any action that helps to peacefully end the war in Yemen is a good action. We seek new approaches from the United States, which we hope will be the peace and benefit of the Yemeni people and lead to peace between Yemen and Saudi Arabia. And speaking of Saudi Arabia, you have recently sent a letter to Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman 
asking for direct negotiations aimed at de-escalating regional tensions and solving the issue and war in Yemen. Has he responded to your letter yet? We regard any action that helps peace as good action. We try to offer our help and, as a human being, I think we should strive for peace in Yemen and also peace between Yemen and Saudi Arabia. The two countries should first decide to make peace and solve the problem based on justice and respect. Our request was met positively by both sides, but the situation became complicated due to the intervention of other countries. We still think the two countries can sit down and solve their issues because people are being killed. Yemenis are dying of disease because they're not receiving medical help. And if I can do anything for peace and ceasefire between the two countries, I will do my best. The region is certainly in motion. Recently, uh, Arab Muslim countries such as the UAE, Bahrain, Morocco, Sudan have all decided to normalize relations with Israel. Could it be because at this particular point they view Iran as the bigger threat to their security than they do Israel? Well, I can only tell you my personal opinion. That's all I can say. If this normalization is to solve a problem, well, it won't solve much without solving the problem of the Palestinian nation. We're talking about a refugee problem and a problem of occupied territories which should be solved within the framework of the Palestinian nation because it's essentially a Palestinian issue. Speaking of Israel, during your presidency, you made numerous controversial speeches and statements about Israel. If you were to be elected again as president, would you be willing to engage in new relations, in a new chapter with Israel? It all depends on the issues there, and the opinions of the Palestinian nation should be taken into consideration. You've already mentioned that you have sent a letter to President Joe Biden, U.S. President Joe Biden, a letter to Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, but you've also sent a letter to Russian President Vladimir Putin, in which you urge him not to extend his rule indefinitely. What was the purpose of this letter? Nine months ago, I wrote a letter to President Putin and recalled our positive meetings with him, as well as relations between Iran and Russia. I suggested that long-term governance is not for the good of nations. Today, I also suggest that he pay attention to public opinion and if the public is not on the side of his governance, then he should make some decisions. We always have to consider the opinions of the people. If the Russian people think differently, they should correct the decision before the problem becomes too difficult to fix. Governance is for the people for human beings, and experiences show that a long-term rule of one person over a nation is not for the benefit of the people. And before that, they also made a change in their constitutional law. I suggested this issue to them because I like the Russian nation and also think Mr. Putin has every intention to successfully serve his people. That's why I made the suggestion. We have talked extensively about many of the foreign policy challenges and issues that Iran is facing. Let's look at some of the domestic ones. And of course, we have to talk about the coronavirus. The world is in the midst of a pandemic. And Iran has been particularly hit hard with 1.5 million cases and up to 60,000 casualties. President Rouhani, as a matter of fact, just warned that a fourth wave 
may be coming soon. In your opinion, how has President Rouhani, how has the Iranian government handled this pandemic? I have shared my opinion about that, which is in line with the Iranian nation's point of view. The Iranian government has been unsuccessful in managing the coronavirus crisis in the country. So a clear criticism of President Rouhani's handling of this health crisis. Yes, I published a video of my criticism of the handling of the coronavirus crisis and candidly spoke of the government's failures. You have increasingly, you are increasingly making your voice heard, not just through interviews such as these, but also on Twitter, where you have over 100,000 followers. Uh, some see your use of Twitter as ironic, if not even hypocritical, given the fact that it was during your presidency that Iran banned social media platforms such as Twitter. Yes, there have been many incidents, many things that happened within this period, but this has no relation to me. People who are filtering Internet sites in Iran are also selling programs that help bypass the filtering. It's meaningless to filter websites in the arena of communication. And it is particularly curious since uh, Twitter is still banned in Iran despite being used by senior officials. So why not make it accessible to the entire public? Why not make it as accessible to all Iranians? What is the government afraid of? You have to ask those people who are not giving permission for that. I think people should use the internet freely. Is it fair to say that since leaving office you have changed attitudes on a number of issues, such as perhaps the usage of Internet to the public or U.S.-Iranian relations. Is that observation fair, that you have changed attitudes on, a new, on, a, on numerous issues? Look, our principles do not change. Every person is growing in knowledge and experience, but from the beginning, we have been searching for and seeking justice and peace. In my first government, we officially wanted to establish relations between the U.S. and Iran and took steps toward it. We officially said that we want direct ties between New York and Tehran. I also personally said we want cooperation instead of confrontation. We do not agree with aggression and occupation. We have always said that we support respect for all nations and want respect for ours. I now have a deeper understanding of justice and have more experience than before. So, I think we have to collaborate to solve the problems and wars and hostility in the world and start building a new world based on justice, peace, humanity, and friendship. President Ahmadinejad, thank you so much for joining us.